Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Johnson Soyama Graduate School of Public Policy's second annual Robertson Lecture. My name is Glenna Juro Sarkisian, and I am a PhD candidate at JSGS. My area of research is under the larger umbrella of climate change, and more specifically, disaster risk reduction and policy coherence. As such, I am really honored to be your MC for tonight's Robertson Lecture. Established in 2007 by the University of Regina and University of Saskatchewan, the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School, or JSGS, is a joint provincial school dedicated to educating graduate students, public servants, and, to, uh, and those across sectors who are interested in advancing public value. With the nationally accredited graduate programs and a wealth of executive education training opportunities, the school is widely recognized for its innovative professional training and research excellence. Speaking of research, we are fortunate that tonight's event is co-sponsored by the School's Center for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy, or CSIP. CSIP was created in 2014 with the support of Dr. Bev Robertson and strives to bridge the current disconnect between science and innovation, policy and governance by drawing together researchers, experts and stakeholders from scientific, social scientific and humanistic fields. Through events such as the Robertson Lecture, we are able to bring together thought leaders, academics, public servants, students and community members to listen and learn about current issues related to science and innovation policy in Canada. While tonight's event is taking place online, JSGS's physical location is located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Kai Chan, is presenting from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of Muskiwam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We are glad to welcome all of those of you who are joining us today across Turtle Island and make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Well, the topic this evening is confronting the climate and ecological crisis with a key internet intersection with policy. With so much information out there, I'm really looking forward to hearing to our guest speaker and his take on our path to genuine policy solutions. Before I turn over to Dr. Loline Berdal, JSGS's JSGS Executive Director, to bring a few remarks, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping rules. We kindly ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of the event. However, do feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&A. The format for tonight's event is as such. Following our opening remarks, our keynote speaker, Dr. Kai Chan, will speak for about 30 minutes. Following his presentation, we will host an audience Q&A discussion, which will be moderated by Liz, Ms. Lynn Gallagher, JSGS Executive in Residence and former Deputy Minister of Environment for the Government of Saskatchewan. During her time with Environment, Lynn led several key initiatives, including the Prairie Resilience, a made in Saskatchewan climate change strategy, the Saskatchewan Go Green strategy for sustainability, and Saskatchewan's first biodiversity action plan. Well, if you would like to ask questions after the presentation, please use the Zoom's chat function to submit your question directly to Liz Lynn Gallagher. Because we have a large audience and a short amount of time, I would encourage you to keep your answers, your questions concise and um, so, that the, so that the speaker can um, answer as many questions as possible. Now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Dr. Loline Burdell and welcome. Thank you, Glenna. And so uh, it's very exciting to, to, be, uh, to be with everyone here tonight. On behalf of the school, I would like to welcome and thank all of you for attending what promises to be an engaging and thought provoking evening. GSGS is pleased to be hosting the second annual Robertson Lecture as a way to bring together thought leaders, academics, students, and community members to discuss and share knowledge on current issues related to science and innovation policy in Canada. 
Scientific knowledge, when properly and clearly shared with policymakers and the media, can greatly improve the quality of the human experience. It is critical that the findings of scientists make, uh, make through rigorous discipline and proven protocols uh, are not misinterpreted or misunderstood in order to preserve the integrity of scientific leadership, public policy, and communications work. The Robertson Lecture is made possible by a generous donation from the late Dr. Bev Robertson, his wife Elaine, and their family. Dr. Robertson was recruited to the University of Regina's physics department in 1969 to work on an automated X-ray diffractometer, uh, and I probably said that wrong, and was involved in the development of crystallographic software uh, before retiring in 1997. He was later conferred as a professor emeritus in 2003. He was also deeply involved in establishing the University of Regina as a standalone academic institution, rather than simply being an extension of the University of Saskatchewan. His tireless work in diplomacy was essential in the fruition of the Saskatchewan Science Centre. In addition to his academic career, Dr. Robertson was well known in the Regina community as the owner of Bushwhacker Brewing Company Limited. In 2014, Dr. Robertson gifted $500,000 to the Johnson Triama Graduate School of Public Policy to assist with the creation of the Center of the Science of the Center for the Science Study of Science and Innovation Policy, we know it as CSIP, and the establishment of the Robertson Student Fellowships, which support graduate student research in the area of science and public policy. I am pleased that several Robertson Fellowship students have joined us tonight, and I would like to acknowledge them now. We have Dinah Tambelo from 2015, Ashawana Bar Uzwana, known as Oz, in 2016, Larissa Shashko from 2017, Alita Salman from 2018, Knut Rosen from 2020, and Rafael Morales Guzman from 2021. We are very fortunate that Dr. Robertson's family members are available to join us here tonight, and a particular welcome to Elaine Robertson. I'd now like to turn the floor to Lynn to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Laleen. And thank you for your leadership at Johnson Shoyama and for your introduction. I want to welcome all of you this evening and thank you for joining us to discuss this important topic, confronting the climate and ecological crisis with intention. The genesis of this topic came from IPBES, Global Assessment. IPBES, or the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, is an independent intergovernmental body established to strengthen the science policy interface for biodiversity and conservation. The report highlighted that humanity is destroying natural capital at an unprecedented rate. Globally, we're putting at risk not only the provision of food and clean water, but also essential services like flood protection, nutrient cycling, and pollination. The emergence of infectious diseases like COVID-19 can be associated with factors such as deforestation, land use change, habitat fragmentation, and urbanization. Just one example of the many and varied risks associated with humanity's mismanagement of our natural resources. Decisions makers, they can often overlook the impacts of their decisions and actions on natural capital because we've allowed it to be easy to do, which poses a significant threat to the well-being of current and future generations. We've been accumulating social wealth, mostly at the expense of the most important life-sustaining asset, our natural capital. The IPES Global Assessment brings to the forefront not only a wealth of knowledge on the status and trends of the natural world, like one million species are now at risk of extinction, but the report includes the social implications of these trends, their direct and indirect causes, and perhaps most important, the actions that can still be taken to ensure a better future for us all. We're fortunate this evening to have with us Dr. Kai Chan. Kai is an interdisciplinary problem-oriented sustainability scientist, that's a mouthful, <laughs> um, trained in ecology, policy, and ethics from both Princeton and Stanford universities. 
Dr. Chan was the coordinating lead author for chapter five of the global assessment, making use of his interdisciplinary skills. He is currently a professor at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. In addition to leading the Pathways and Solutions chapter for the Global Assessment, he's published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals. As an interdisciplinary sustainability science, Kai leads Chan's lab, Connecting Human and Natural Systems, and is the lead editor of the new British Ecological Society journal, People and Nature. He is an agent of change towards sustainability. Kai co-funded CoSphere, a community of small planet heroes, which seeks to make it easy, enjoyable, and empowering for individuals and organizations to leverage transformative change towards sustainability. Kai has a bunch of honors, but he didn't want to burden me with reading them tonight. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chai to speak to us about change, in particular, transformative change with intention. So thank you, Dr. Chai, for joining us this evening, and I'll turn it over to you. There we go. Thank you so much, Lynn. And thank you to Karen and Glenna and Loleen and to the Robertson family. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, it's uh, from the unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation, as Glenna so kindly said. Um, this it was a it was such an easy decision to do this talk. Um, Lynn's invitation was just perfect in terms of setting up this community that you have here at the school. Um, so I'm just really excited about the conversation that, uh, that we're going to have. There are, I'm going to start, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. We're going to start on May 6th of 2019 when this report made headlines that up to a million species are at risk of extinction due to human activities. Many of you might have woken up to this news and heard it again and again in various forms over the coming three weeks, because up to 25,000 articles, over 25,000 articles um, online were about this particular story, um, reaching most people on the planet multiple times. So that's the 19.4 billion aggregate circulation just online, not including radio, TV, and print media. And it fueled a rise in concern about not just climate, but also this ecological crisis and the two of them interlinked intimately, which brought millions of people to the streets to protest the lack of action on these fronts. As I don't need to tell you, that organizing was stopped in a big way by the pandemic, which came just a few months after those events in the fall of 2019, and really paused the momentum. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is I'm gonna give you some highlights from the IPBES Global Assessment. Um, IPBES is, by the way, the multilingual friendly way to say this awkward acronym of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. I'm going to introduce you to the idea of transformative change. I'm going to take you back into Paris, where that press conference happened, which led to the press on May 6th, and explain the negotiations about this science and then what happened since, and reflect then on the path to genuine policy solutions and say a little bit about the necessity of civic action and how I hope that COSIER can start to fill a part of that void. If you've heard of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, then in a sense you've heard about the prequel to the IPBES Global Assessment, because that Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was an unofficial form of what then ensued um, under IPBES, which is sits in a very parallel way to the IPCC for climate change in the UN family of organizations. And so over 500 actually of the world's leading experts contributed to this monumental effort to take stock of the status of life on earth and what is driving the changes in that and its implications for human societies. So it included this 
representation of how different groups of organisms are doing in terms of the levels of threat according to the IUCN red list. And you can see that for many of these major groups, starting with mammals and going down, over 25% of the species in these groups are threatened with extinction. When you look at it in terms of a time trend, you can see a large increase recently in the cumulative percentage of species driven to extinction. And then even over a much compressed time scale, just from the 1980s onwards, you can see noticeable decreases and even stark decreases in some groups in terms of their species survival. And this is not just statistics. This is real organisms whose life stories play out in dramatic fashion. I wonder how many of you remember hearing about Orca J35 from the Southern resident Orca population, which used to number in at least the 150s, if not hundreds. And now we're down to 72 animals, it seems. And J35 in, 20, in the summer of 2018, when she gave birth to a stillborn calf, rather than let that baby drop to the bottom of the Salish Sea, she carried it around on her snout for 17 days, as if parading it around for us all to see her misery and in a sense, to bear the shame of being the primary cause, whether it's shipping and other transport, other forms of ocean noise, whether it's how we take the salmon that they depend upon, one way or another, we are fundamentally responsible for the loss of these organisms. Coral reefs, we've already lost 50% of them to coral bleaching, which is triggered by a variety of different kinds of factors, including climate change and the warming and a little bit of acidification, plus pollution, sedimentation, and eutrophication of coastal environments. It's heartbreaking for coral reef scientists. Some of my colleagues go to these meetings and, and, and report as they come back that they many of them were in tears at these conferences because they know that this is a one-way track for so many of these ecosystems. And it's not just the critters, it's also what they do for us. As one example of those ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people, animals contribute to 91 of 107 leading global crop types by pollinating them. And if you value that in terms of what that contributes economically, that ecosystem service is worth somewhere between 235 and 577 billion dollars per year. It's a tremendous amount of money. And when you look at the trends of those ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. Here there are 18 different categories of them. You can see that globally, across multiple different metrics representing the status of these contributions, you can see that most of the news is bad news. Either a uniform decrease or a variable decrease, and only a few tiny examples of variable increases with not a single example of a uniform increase. And even these three that look like they're good news, they're not really that good news because this is the percentage of arable crops, sorry, the percentage of arable land that's grown in biofuels and the percent that's grown in crops. So these two are actually measures of our intervention in ecosystems, our transformation of them rather than their capacity to deliver services. And so when you think about hardwood floors or hardwood furniture, we also need to think about the loss of flood mitigation, which is, you know, is a factor that is not much talked about in terms of the floods that are happening just around my house here in British Columbia and the loss of the stabilization of slopes that, give, that gives rise to mudslides, which here pictured in Haiti, but also represented just not far from my house that has washed out bridges and roads, including the Trans-Canada Highway. Of course, it has implications for forest dependent species um, when logging operations um, cut into forests, either le legally or illegally, such as this white ruffed mannequin depicted here. And as I talked about earlier, it, these effects trickle all the way downstream 
to undermine not just aquatic ecosystems, but also marine ones, such as coral reefs, in the form of sedimentation and eutrophication, which is the excess nitrogen and, fer and phosphorus from fertilizers and other chemicals that gives rise to algal blooms that choke these reefs. So my colleagues at, in chapter three within the global assessment then took stock of how we were doing in terms of the Aichi biodiversity targets, which have now come to maturity in 2020 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which will mature in 2030. And so it's now no surprise that we were not on track for those Aichi biodiversity targets. There are a few examples of good news. Um, and I'm going to gloss over those and then move on to point out that the changes in nature and nature's contributions that the chapter two team documented are actually, for the most part, actually undermining our ability to make progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are a few elements where there is some positive progress, but it is insufficient in this column in order to meet those sustainable development goals. And there's not a single entry, unfortunately, in the column that represents sufficient progress towards those goals. So these are, this is a litany of bad news, basically, in the first four chapters of this global assessment. The first, introducing the problem. The second being the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in a nutshell, which is the status and trends of nature, nature's contributions to people and the drivers of change. And then the third being our, the progress towards the goals. And the fourth initially had the tentative title of all plausible futures. And I, I pushed back as soon as I found out about that preliminary title to say, look, that, that's not, you're reviewing the quantitatively specified scenarios and models, and that is not all the plausible futures. And it's important that we push back on that because unfortunately, all those plausible futures that were quantitatively specified showed us not being on track to meet this sustainable development goals even with changes in terms of how we're doing. But it was the ones that were quantitatively specified, we called business as usual and small variations. They were effectively incremental change. And in chapter five, we were given the mandate to explore a broader set of possible futures, looking at a range of more optimistic scenarios that could not be entirely specified quantitatively, looking at pathway analyses and participatory and pathway analyses that imagined what the world would look like if we were optimistic and bold about sustainability, what that looked like and how we could get there from here. Chapter six followed up with a more in-depth look at policy options, obstacles and opportunities. But I am so glad that I had the pleasure to work on chapter five. To be honest, it was still not that much fun, but it was, a sh it was a heck of a lot more fun than it would have been just documenting the decline because we got to imagine the positive possible outcomes. The way that we broke up our work was to carve up the challenge of sustainable development associated with nature into six different focal points in a nexus analysis. And this is basically how the literature parses out because it's not a, you know, a single literature that speaks to itself homogeneously. And what we did was to evaluate the scenarios and pathway analyses within each of these clusters of the literature and to examine what it seemed to take to achieve this, each separate cluster of goals, but also not to undermine the other focal points. So, for example, some of the solutions that this team encountered in terms of how to feed humanity with terrestrial agriculture without degrading nature on land found that some of the solutions actually involved large scaling up of the inputs in the form of pesticides and fertilizers, as well as water from irrigation, all of which collectively both withdrew freshwater from freshwater ecosystems, as well as degraded the remaining freshwater in the form of that sedimentation and freshwater pollution that then eutrophies downstream environments, both in freshwater ecosystems, as well as in the, on the coast, thus undermining this focal point and also this one. So we looked for solutions that didn't only solve one, but actually addressed multiple focal points simultaneously. What we found 
it was the, the kind of action we needed was a massive scaling up in protected areas and also active restoration. A move towards sustainable practices in forestry, agriculture, fisheries, and mining. A revolution towards a clean energy economy and also carbon sequ sequestration and storage. And all of that being managed on the landscape and in seascapes through multi-stakeholder land use and coastal. Handy. The next question was, how can we do all of that? Because that is a really tall order. And the truth is that our current societal institutions are not equipped to just go and do that because science says so. And so what we did in the chapter was to divvy up the work actually from day one into two different pieces. One of which was this nexus analysis of scenarios that I told you about. And a second part was around a series of levers and leverage points. Basically, what are the cross-cutting societal changes that are necessary in order to enable the kinds of changes to direct drivers of degradation that I just talked about? So we called those levers, for governance interventions and then leverage points, which are those points in social ecological systems that are most important. And from the first meeting, we drafted a set of possible levers and leverage points. And then we followed those through in a series of 13 different literature reviews targeted on each of those. We had constant interaction between three more meetings of this author team, and we had four drafts, each of which was reviewed, and three of them externally. All of that culminated in this set of levers and leverage points that you might have seen before. And I have to say that from the 30 minute version of this talk, it's really hard to understand what really is novel here, because it sounds all like what you have surely heard before. But there's some really important differences. One, in terms of um, incentives and capacity building here, we're not just talking about layering on positive incentives to the existing incentive structures that are for the most part broken. We're talking about the large scale reform of incentive structures through the reform and elimination of subsidies that are enhancing of production and extraction without addressing their environmental externalities. In terms of the leverage points, we're talking about a very different story than what you hear in the IPC, from the IPCC, which suggests that we can continue on with business as usual in terms of our growing demand for energy and for so many other products. In our report, we found actually that it was not possible to achieve the full suite of UN Sustainable Development Goals unless we actually reined in that growth in total consumption, which is a combination of per capita consumption as well as population growth, which plays out very differently in different regions. Now that doesn't change on its own easily. Indeed, a fundamental driver of the growth in consumption is this notion that we have adopted in so many Western nations that and are exporting to so many other nations that a good life is one that entails a high level of material intensity and consumption. And quite fortunately, there are a great number of other notions of what a good life entails that are very different and that are rooted in relationships, both with nature and with other people. The key then is this third, which where we found contrary to the expectation of many of the reviewers, as well as even many of the authors on our team, that it did not seem to be necessary to have a massive change in values before getting started on the hard work of transformative change, but rather that many of the values that are appear to be needed are actually quite prevalent across populations. They're just not active in the form of widespread societal norms and actions because of institutions and infrastructure that impede those values from being expressed. Now I could say so much more about all of these, but I'm gonna have to move on to point out that we did find some success stories, some partial ones in Namibia, Sweden, Costa Rica, the US, Seychelles, 
and New Zealand. And based on those success stories that showed multiple interacting levers and leverage points, we speculated in a paper that followed in People and Nature about different possible trajectories that involved chains, positive chains of events where unleashing one lever or leverage point could actually have a ripple effect, a domino effect in a positive direction. All of this was contentious in ways that some of our author team anticipated and many of us did not, were not prepared for. So one of the key paragraphs about that described the, this, these needed changes towards a global sustainable economy, that described the need for that reform of subsidies, the need to move beyond GDP, including all of the notions of a good life that are wrapped up in there towards truly inclusive measures of wealth that represent economic, sorry, environmental losses, to move towards a global price on carbon effectively, as Trudeau called for, as well as on so many other pollutants. These were really contentious, such that this paragraph was actually deleted three times over the course of the negotiations. Um, and so that's a key point that many people don't realize is that the text of the summary for policymakers from this global assessment is actually not just the text from scientists. In fact, we delivered a draft that had been reviewed, as I said, four times, but then it was negotiated word by word by the 132 member nations in the plenary. And so this is a rare moment of me smiling on the stage in a UN theater that had 132 nations representatives underneath in teams of somewhere between two and I think nine individual diplomats representing those nations with simultaneous translation in six UN languages as they discussed this paragraph that was so contentious. That story probably gives you a sense of the nature of the obstacles that stand between us and a more sustainable pathway. We're just saying that transformative change is needed, needed does not translate to the kind of private action or government action that it actually brings that about. So following the global assessment, I uh, had the opportunity to lay out a series of concrete actions that were necessary or seemed to be necessary for transformative change based on our analyses. Um, and I'm not going to talk about each of these here, but I did get the chance to talk about them to the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development for the House of Commons, just as Kate Brahman, my colleague in the US, had the chance to give testimony to Congress in, south of the border. And this experience was not all that I had hoped it would be. Um, to be honest. And, and I lay out the story of that um, in this blog post on the Coastfear site, what I welcome you all to read. In a nutshell, it revealed to me that governments are not ready to take the kind of action that we laid out. We have abundant evidence of an unjust, unsustainable, inequitable trajectory. Governments agree that transformative change is needed. And many governments and also NGOs are using this language about transformative change in order to argue for the kinds of marginal changes that they have been working on already. In this context, the big changes remain virtually untouched. And so what that means for us is that the marginal changes that are so, you know, that's our bread and butter. That's most of our job descriptions, to be honest, are in danger of being overwhelmed by undesirable transformations that will come down the pipe as a result of the social and ecological changes that we're seeing, right, every day, including this week here in British Columbia. It raises the question as to whether purely incremental approaches to policymaking might actually be counterproductive to the ultimate goal of sustainable development because they distract us from the hard work of actually changing these systems that effectively set the destiny for all policymaking. 
The theory of change associated with this kind of science policy interface holds that government action is responsive to science. It believes that governments across the world will act in the long-term public interest. It necessarily also believes that existing structures in governments and also in intergovernmental organizations like the UN are sufficient and capable, so either sufficient or capable of reforming themselves for the sake of transformative change. I don't buy it. And so the approaches that I personally see as being a crucial addition to this mix, where of course there is a crucial role for these science policy processes, but they're not sufficient. And um, by the way, if anybody can erase the red marks on the slides, that would be awesome. I don't know how they happen, but I, uh, there is an eraser somewhere, um, are ones that involve unleashing the values that I talked about. And when we're talking about values, we're not just talking about either intrinsic or instrumental values, which are the classic ways that the environmental movement has understood values for the last 50 years, right? The values of nature that are separate from any benefit to us or the benefit to us in the form of ecosystem services. These are both for sure really important. But as I told the, um, the set of experts that assembled for the IPES conceptual framework way back in 2013 when I first got engaged with IPES, that is not the full set of reasons that the that ecosystems and nature matter to people, nor the full set of reasons why they get motivated to do something about it. We are motivated in the in many cases, if not the majority of cases, by our preferences, principles, and virtues about our relationships with nature or about our relationships with other people where the environment, environment mediates that relationship. So, for example, ideas that a place is important to me, who I am as a person, or at the collective scale, important to us as a people, or a notion of responsibility for you that means that I should not pollute your water because of concern for how that, or, or degrade the ecosystems that help clean the water because of concern for how that undermines your well-being. The idea that we might leverage those relational values into widespread societal action towards transformative change and sustainable futures is the one that gives us hope at Cosphere, which is a community of small planet heroes. Our vision is for humanity to become nature positive, actively supporting a sustainable future in which people live in harmony with nature. And we intend to do that by making it easy, enjoyable, and empowering to initiate and support transformative change towards these sustainable practices and societies. It involves laying out some of the logic behind the levers and the leverage points and also the six systems for transformation, as well as helping people to realize that the ways that they have been asked to be active for the sake of the environment are so limited for the most part they are mostly constrained to consuming differently, recycling, composting, commuting differently. All of those are private actions. And in terms of private actions, our individual contributions are but a drop in the bucket because we each individually are one of eight billion odd human beings on this planet. And so the science of transformative change is clear that if we want to unleash this kind of large system-wide change, we also need to attend at least equally, if not predominantly, to the signals that we send about what is acceptable or appropriate or necessary from a moral perspective. And we need to work to actually transform systems through direct action and through civic action, including voting for meaningful measures of change. One part of that, thinking about those visions of a good life, is to take direct aim at the notion that a good life is one that might involve flying on a private jet to a private island. This kind of excessive consumption, 
this life of leisure and luxury that many people can't help but aspire to in one way or another rests upon widespread ecological destruction through prevalent environmental externalities, not to mention the vast underpricing of human labor, including, in effect, taking advantage of slave labor in so many supply chains. We can change the perception that this is a desirable way to live. We can make it seem just as it is empirically, a something that is wrapped up in systems that are fundamentally broken. Here, our theory of change is totally different from the science policy interface that I have had the pleasure to dwell at for years. We believe that the values are there, that millions of people want a better, more sustainable future and are willing to work for it. But what's lacking is the feeling that we can do it together the knowledge of what specifically we need to do to accomplish that meaningful change, a central platform to take that kind of action, and a community to do that together. And so when you think about where Greta started, it's crucial to remember that if, if in response to that plea, you feel alone, that you are not alone. You're surrounded, actually, by people who want to do the hard work of transformative change. To sum it up, we need deep change, and we need it now. And in that context, civic action is a necessary component of public policy. So I hope that you'll join us at CoSphere, or if not, that you'll do something else that pushes towards the kind of change that governments have agreed is needed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Chan, and um, for your insight and your passion. I know I was excited when I got to first start speaking with you about this because you certainly um, share the passion of many of us. Um, a reminder to the audience, um, Karen has um, sent out some um, information to you around questions. Uh, we do have a few. Um, so if you have a question, if you could send it to me directly by chat and I will pass it on on your behalf um, and we get, I'll get started here with one of our first questions is from David Hilderman. Um, and he's talking um, about on September 26, 2011, the Australian government reported that the Great Barrier Reef was experiencing record high levels of coverage. Um, this was the highest level since they have been tracking in 1985. And wondering if you could explain some of the discrepancy there. Sorry, record high levels of, I missed the word that followed Lynn. Could I you... think he just used the term record. So let Re me see here. Record high levels of. David, if you get it, can you just pop that last word in for us? Coverage. coverage. So coverage of, of, are you saying of corals? Maybe that is what you're saying. So 2011 is a long time ago for one. Um, it's worth noting that the Great Barrier Reef is the singular best managed coral ecosystem on the planet. So the Great Barrier Reef is doing much better than many other coral ecosystems, but 2011 was a long time ago. Um, oh, okay. So uh, if we're talking about 2021, then um, I, I'm not sure what science you're thinking of. By, by my knowledge, there has been a large scale loss of corals across the Great Barrier Reef um, due to a combination of factors, as I mentioned. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything that suggests that uh, that corals are actually doing really well in Australia because that the best understanding that I have is, as I said, globally, we've lost 50% of corals and that every, oh, virtually every coral ecosystem on the planet is under serious threat through a combination of factors that I mentioned earlier. So I think in some subsequent information he provided, you know, talking about the concern that there's, you know, an alarmist um, 
narrative going on and you know trying to balance people's understanding of what's happening in the ecosystems um, with um, you know rising concerns and and wondering if that is true and trying to understand that um, I, I think is is sometimes an important concern that you know we see as we're trying to gain um, interest in in moving policy agendas along. Do you have, uh, maybe maybe if you can talk more about that um, sense of is are we being too alarmist? Is there too much negative information out there? Yeah, I mean, as a community, for sure, there is a lot of negative information out there, and some of it is too alarmist, right? So the notion that we have, you know, eight years left to save the planet is absolutely hyperbolic, right? Like, the planet is going to is going to be here, whether we solve the climate crisis in a way that is suitable for humanity or not, right? So, so for sure, there is hyper hyperbole out there. My understanding of the situation with corals is that that's not most of where the hyperbole is, that, that indeed there, there is an extremely dire situation. As I said, I've got lots of friends who are coral reef scientists, and I don't have a single one of them that has suggested that the, the, you know, this representation of corals being one of the most endangered ecosystems on the planet is, is at, at all um, unclear in terms of a massive support from, from the scientific literature. So, you know, I, I, the Mark Twain's quote that the, that a lie can make it around the world before the truth has time to get its boots on is, is something that we just need to realize here, right? Mm -hmm. But like for every, for every piece of legitimate scientific information that seems to be at odds with people's lived experiences, right? I mean, you could go to the Great Barrier Reef and you could, you could for sure still find intact corals, right? But, you know, the scientists that have been doing surveys year in and year out, aerial surveys as well as dive surveys, have documented a widespread and troubling decline, right? So, so when individuals rely upon their lived experience and say, look, there's some beautiful corals still there. It's like, absolutely there are, of course there are, right? Not every place is being lost, but the, the magnitude of the threat and the magnitude of the loss, the global assessment is incontrovertible in terms of that, right? So, so we are absolutely losing a lot and anybody who says otherwise is calling the best science that we have available alarmist. Thank you. So I have another interesting question from Grace talking about Canada is one of the top countries of private owner, car ownership and transportation accounts for 25% of JSG emissions per data by economic sector in Canada. And she wonders, do you think the growing prevalence of working from home, um, the technology development um, like drone de delivery um, will have an impact reducing GHG emissions regarding transportation in the future? Yeah, I, you know, a few th interesting things happened um, as a result of the pandemic. One of them was this move towards working from home um, with the great rollout of vaccination that we've had. We've seen a return to working in offices at least some days of the week. Um, at the same time, we also saw a bit of a flight from the city as people moved out of the city to be closer to nature and further from their workplaces. So, you know, how the combination of these various factors will play out in terms of emissions is anybody's best guess. You know, I, I, I do think you're right that we'll probably see a dip as a result of this increasing trend towards working from home. I really hope that we see a decrease in emissions associated with air travel as we have got used to working in for some of these purposes remotely. The fact that we're doing this talk remotely instead of in person, the fact that I didn't fly to you is one of these examples where we're, we're making do and, and hopefully it's a pretty good replacement for the real thing. Thank you. 
Um, you know, Jessica is wondering if you have any tips for students, and perhaps this would be broader than students, you know, wanting to get involved. You, you mentioned some of the, the work that you're doing. Um, are, there, are there other areas where you can see um, individuals um, being uh, able to make a uh, real movement and, and gain towards contributing to sustainability? Yeah. Um, it's great, great to have students on, on this call. Um, I guess, you know, so there, there are loads of opportunities to make a really meaningful difference, for sure. Every single context that I can imagine. Um, and I, I have a whole bunch of students and I, and, I, and I hope that none of them feel disempowered by the story that I've told today. The, what I do tell stu my students is just always look out for the systemic effects and the opportunities to have not just an incremental effect within a system, but to question and start to shift these systems to be much better at, at, um, designed to be able to address the challenges that we face. The vast majority of the institutions that we have today are remnants from past centuries that had totally different realities, right? Where, where the challenge that faced Canadian institutions was one of like populating the West, right? Like this kind of deeply colonialist problematic narrative of like trying to really quickly take occupy land and extract natural resources. That's not the challenge of today, but our institutions remain, right? That were designed in those times. So question the institutions, look for real deep opportunities, not only the kind of low hanging fruit of incremental change. Well, and, and thanks for that answer. And we have a, a good follow-up questions from Peter. He talks about how, you know, examples set by our leaders such as Trudeau in terms of lifestyle, do as I say, not as I do. Um, examples set by tens of thousands of attendees at COP. Um, why do you expect young adults who can't afford their own home and will not have the basics like food, shelter, and basic possessions that their parents had to buy in when they see leadership being so hypocritical? I'm so disappointed when I heard that Trudeau had flown over sites of needed reconciliation and turned down invitations to you know, visit the, what is it, $12 million holiday home in Tofino. I just like, yeah, I mean, that, that was exactly the thought that went through my mind. I mean, I don't, I don't want to beat up on Trudeau in particular, although there's plenty to beat up on. Um, you know, that we do have a crisis of, of being just legitimate, right? Like, of, 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 and this is where the private actions actually really do matter, right? Like, it's not, they don't matter because they're the drop in the bucket. They matter because if you're not doing the private actions, you're a hypocrite, right? And you have nothing to say to the rest of us. And so, I mean, I would just say, look, just, just because we have some individuals who don't live up to the hopes that you had every reason to put in them, that doesn't mean that there's nobody who is both talking the talk and walking the walk, right? Look elsewhere. Though the folks that can't do, are not doing that for you, they are symptomatic of broken systems. Our electoral system, in my mind, is a broken system in this country. And Trudeau realized that when he first got elected in, what, 2015, um, on the promise of electoral reform, which he then backed away from, right? And so not to argue argue for anybody else, right? But just to say that our federal level politics, they could use a change. And, you know, so if you're feeling jaundiced about that, feeling cynical, I share that feeling, get active in that space and make that change happen. Yes, good, good, good response. Uh, from Oz, he, he, he thanks you for the presentation and he's really interested in the discussion of value. And, do you equate this with morality? Not exactly. So lots of our values are about our preferences, what, what we would like. And th so those aren't, don't immediately translate into what is right and wrong. But 
values are intertwined with morality for sure, right? And and so one one key purpose for engaging with values is to understand what makes a genuinely better life. That's where the idea of valuation comes in. A second really key role for values is to probe what is an appropriate life or what is an appropriate design for our civic institutions, right? And so, so this is where we need to bring values into conversations about politics, for example, where so frequently those conversations devolve to like costs and benefits and, you know, which are, which are rooted to one particular notion of, of morality that I think most people would actually argue against, you know, the, this notion that all that matters is the costs and benefits and that there's, you know, so for example, right, it would cost the oil sands, would cost the Canadian economy something to do a radical transformation away from fossil fuels. According to the logic of costs and benefits, that seems like it doesn't make sense. But there is a level at which we have to confront the legitimacy of a pathway that involves continuing to peddle our fossil fuels on global markets for nations to burn other than ourselves, right? We aren't counting those emissions in our trajectories because to do so would mean that we would never be able to achieve a decrease in our emissions without actually rain, railing in oil and gas production. But here in Canada, we're trying to have it both ways, right? And so, so this is one of those places where, yeah, we have to bring in conversations about values and about morality into spaces of public policy where they are not normally drawn upon. I think, thank you. So Cecilia has a, um, or Celia has a really good question, I think, that, that matches with, you know, moving towards some of the things you've talked about. Um, she asked, you know, the conservation, restoration, and management of nature is clearly critical, not only for biodiversity conservation, but as well as for climate change adaptation and mitigation, and for sustainable development. However, it often seems that scientists, practitioners, policy makers discuss these issues and find solutions for these issues separately. And based on your experience, how do we ensure greater collaboration among these different communities of practice to ensure global action that leads to transformative change, the, the change that we need? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's a good point. For sure, we need to have more engagement between practitioners and policymakers, and you know, and and this this means different things for different audiences, right? So, for scientific audiences where the incentive structures appear to be to reward publication in the academic literature, it's incumbent upon us to challenge that and to seek out those venues that allow for a genuine exchange with policymakers and practitioners. At People in Nature, the journal that I'm one of the lead editors for, not, not the sole lead editor, um, one of the lead editors for, we, we, we have committed to work to that, right? So we, we seek to have conversation that involves science, but also practice, which is just fundamentally important. There are conferences and meetings, you know, there, there are ones that are purely academic, but there are also ones that involve this really vibrant exchange across government officials and NGO folks and business leaders. Um, here in the Vancouver area, we have, well, I mean, it's broader, it's the whole Pacific Northwest effectively. Um, well, I mean, not quite the whole, but it's called the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference. It's an amazing regional conference. And so there are lots like that. And you, so you can seek out those opportunities. Uh, on the policy maker practitioner side, you know, like just keep keep in touch with scientists, you know, keep um, make friends with folks that are on the academic side that are interested in having those conversations. For a while, we had uh, some practitioners who came to my lab group meetings um, and it was wonderful. It was great. Right. And so, yeah, seek out those kinds of opportunities. One one step at a time, we can make this more normal. Still lots, lots more questions. Thanks for, <laughs> you're, you're doing great here, keeping up with us. Um, we have another one, uh, you know, talking more, we, we are a school at Jata Shoyama um, of 
you know, folks who are learning and um, developing their skills in public policy. And we've been asked, what's your advice would be to a person starting out in a policy career, particularly within areas that are not typically associated with climate, environment, natural resources, such as in health, um, social policy, but also care deeply about criminal justice. Yeah. Look for the opportunities. You know, I think so many of my students in um, at UBC, my undergraduate students, some of them, a whole bunch of them imagine that they're going to do something related to the environment, but then lots of them already know that they're not going to. And, and I want to reach all of them with the message that these ideas actually can permeate all of those fields and sectors that you mentioned, right? Uh, I was telling Lynn and the others in, in, in the breakout room before we got started that one of my best friends is uh, director of planetary, new director of planetary health at the University of Ottawa. He's a, he's a surgeon, a colorectal surgeon, and he's had all kinds of leadership positions in medicine. And now he's, he's doing his best to bring sustainability and meet, meeting the climate crisis into his job through this new role as the director of planetary health. We call him Captain Planet. <laughs> and, you know, and, I, and the same opportunities are available for anybody who's passionate about this stuff in any sector, because we can, we can, you know, they're not islands. The sectors are not islands. They interact fundamentally. I think you make a really good point in government. We, you know, we were always trying to break down silos and work more collaboratively together on, you know, what some people call wicked problems or these, these large problems that are often related to the sustainable development um, goals that have been listed. So I, I think it's, it's really important that, that we are able to work together. We have another question about, um, you know, what's being done to reach the wider public to provide detailed explanations on climate change, on what each individual could do since we all need to work together. You know, are there any um, examples of specific policies being de developed or adopted across Canada? Specific policies for, for helping individuals understand climate science? Is that, is that how you understood that, Lynn? I, I think also that and knowing what they can do. I, you know, I think as we all understand, this is such a complicated topic. Um, how do we get that information into the hands of individuals so that uh, we can all contribute? Uh, are, are there ways that you know, we're, we're working towards that uh, in Canada? Are there other examples that are going on internationally? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a whole bunch of different efforts um, by academics to help to make the science of climate change and also what we can do to address the climate crisis more available to, to the public. Um, there's, uh, in fact, Stephen Shepard at UBC is leading one of those efforts. Um, at Cosphere, that's very much also what, what we are aspiring to do, right? Is to make it really accessible to people. The science that underpins our knowledge about these crises, as well as what are meaningful solutions. So, you know, if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to check out Coaster. We want, we want to grow that so that we can represent a, a much broader base of science and a much broader set of initiatives in terms of analyzing the ones that are really helpful towards this goal of transformative change and, you know, separating those from the ones that actually might be distractions. Um, it's, yeah, it's really important. I, I want to say that we've made a lot of progress on this front, actually, in terms of the, the media's communication about climate science. I was just thinking that this morning. There's this amazing article by Catherine Blaise Baum in, in the Globe and Mail today that lays out this current crisis here in BC with the floods that we're experiencing and, and, and traces it to multiple different um, factors that finger climate change, but also other human interventions and ecosystems. And, and, and that, you know, that is, has only been possible through just the, this 
series of conversations that have become much more common in my experience, at least between journalists and scientists where, you know, Simon Donner was one of the people that uh, Catherine Blaisbaum spoke to for that article. And he's a colleague of mine at UBC. And, you know, I think both Simon and I and others, like we, we've got these like running conversations with journalists where, where we're, we try to help them to understand these issues more deeply rather than just to give them a nugget of like, you know, here's a soundbite for this particular issue for this particular story to help bring them up to speed with a broader base so that they can, you know, not in that particular story necessarily, but orient towards stories that are like really getting to the heart of the matter. And so on that, I'd say also seek out really good journalism because there is good journalism out there, but, you know, it, it's being eroded by this like prevalent mistaken belief, I would say, that social media can somehow replace true, real journalism by, you know, through the CBC, Global Mail, and other great sources. National, National Observer is another. Uh, good, good advice, as I think it's it's so important as we break through, uh, you know, those those social media messages and try to find the real nuggets of, of um, knowledge that, that we can act on in society. Yeah, Marie has a question that, you know, is asking about, you know, who are the main changers? Like there's different uh, factions in society that, you know, have different um, goals and objectives. And uh, do we know where the, the real um, main agents of change are around this area? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if you do a map of who has power in the system currently governance systems you know policy political systems as well as industry you actually end up bringing in every single actor that's there i would say in a sense everyone has power and and in other senses everyone is constrained and so from any, and this is where, from any particular vantage point, you can find opportunities and to make real meaningful differences in those systems. A part of it comes from analyzing the system as a system, right? From, from really understanding how these say governance systems or industry systems, how they work, why they work that way, how they might work differently. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think there is anyone, it's not, it's corporations don't have all the power in this system, right, in a sense, because corporations are somewhat beholden to their shareholders. And so, you know, do shareholders have the power? Well, yes, in a sense, you know, they do. And so for sure, in, in the current system, wealthier individuals have much more power than those who do not have that wealth. But there, that's not to say that you, if you don't have a lot of money, that you don't have power in the system. It, it is there. It is there to be seized. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm going to duck that in the sense of like, I think that power is, is much more dynamic. Than, than many other people do. Well, I think this, this next question follows up on that by, by talking about you know, how, and using Saskatchewan perhaps as an example, um, can we impress upon elected officials the necessity of addressing climate change in a real and tangible way, not just giving it lip service? especially giving the, given the feeling by many, including business, industry, government, uh, labor force, that um, climate action means the loss of jobs instead of seeing it as an opportunity to grow new sectors. Yeah, absolutely. Short-termism is one of the biggest problems in this context of our transformation towards a clean energy and clean technology economy, where the fear of losing jobs in the short term, which has been with us on this file for decades, has prevented us from moving strongly in the direction of creating so many more jobs and so many more economic opportunities through the growth of the clean energy and clean technology sectors. We were doing okay on that front, right? We could have done so much better if we didn't waste so much time trying to prop up the oil and gas industry in Canada um, historically, but it's not too late. 
we need to recognize that there will be short-term losses. We need to believe in the adaptability and the resilience and the creativity of Canadians and find ways to support Canadians in their own personal transformations, you know, transitions out of, for example, the oils, the oil sands into more sustainable livelihoods. Um, and along the way, we need to confront the companies, right? Because in this, in this debate about the transformation for, for away from fossil fuels, we have lumped together individual workers who have so much to lose through this transformation with fossil fuel companies and, and energy companies. And I don't have a lot of pity for the energy companies, frankly right? They have been railing against climate action for decades. They've known that it was essential. They can, you know, they can move now or they can move, you know, they could have moved before or they can move later. It doesn't matter much to me, right? Yes, some rich people are going to lose some money in, in this. That is going to happen. But I have sympathy for the workers. And, and I think we really need to distinguish those policies that enable workers to adapt into this transition or transformation and separate it from like the need to prop up companies that have been standing in the way of reform for literally decades. Now in this next question here, oh, I think- Sorry, actually, Lynn, let me, let me just return. The question was, how do we, how do we hold politicians accountable? How do we, how do we, actually let them know what we believe is necessary. And I would say like, tell them, <laughs> you know, call them, write to them and make it specific about what you're asking for, right? Like you need to specify it in terms of the kinds of policies, the kinds of laws that you want to see, the kinds of climate targets that need to be in, interpreted in terms of policies. And, and then you need to hold them accountable, right? You need to say, look, I'm not voting for you unless you have a package that does this. And then, you know, work, organize, or work with your people, right? Get other people on board with you. And if you have enough people on your side, then for sure people, politicians will listen. They do listen to voters. Well, I, I, I was gonna go on to say that I think this next question really does follow up on that because you know I, this was always the, um, the holy grail that as you know when you're working in public policy that you're you're aiming towards and that the question is how can government chart policy that will systematically reorient, reorient citizens values without being perceived as being austere or becoming unpopular you know i think that you know she's followed that up with because uh, most people become more materialistic as become more successful so changing values has to start from the home and from early childhood uh, work is most definitely cut out for policy advocates for these changes so I'm not proposing that government take a role of trying to change people's values. Governments already do that, and I'm asking them to stop effectively. Now, the way that we do that is by promoting consumption and economic growth as the solution to all problems, right? Or to almost all problems. That, that's a stance that governments have been taking for so long, despite the fact that there is abundant evidence that more consumption is not actually a positive thing from a well being perspective for most of us. Absolutely, there are people in Canada that need to consume more to have a good life. When we look beyond Canada, of course, there are billions of people on this planet that need to consume more to have a good life. But for many of us, that is not going to help us live a better life. And yet it's the message that we have been sold by governments that are that see the growth in GDP, the growth in the economy as synonymous with progress, right? If that has been propaganda that has is absolutely orienting people's values. They still, there are so many people also still have conflicting values that we just need to get out of the way 
of allowing people to express those values that are much more relational, right? How many times have people told, been told, you know, to that they ought to do their service by getting out there and, you know, and and participating in the economy by spending more? That is not a complete solution to these problems. And the simplistic representation of it as such is deeply problematic. Well, and I, I think this this next question from Lorianne really talks more about that is, you know, perhaps private actions for social engineering to change the world. What makes good life seem more attainable? Is there really a concentrated effort util utilizing social media to move us in that direction? I, because you um, got muted for a second there, I'm not sure if I the whole question. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, so she's talking about, you know, with this whole need to, you know, private actions for social engineering to change worldview of what makes a good life seems more attainable. Is there already a concentrated effort utilizing, utilizing social media to move us in this direction? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't see, I don't see that. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, yeah, because when the pandemic hit and, and we had celebrities trying to comfort us all uh, to, you know, about the kind of hardships of being confined to our homes, and they were, you know, do shooting these videos of them singing on their like sprawling estates and ranches, right? Like, I, I don't know how many of you saw any of those videos, but I, I think they're striking. In response to that, there was the, this like cultural moment of recognition that there's like this massive divide between these people that we kind of worship as celebrities um, and the rest of us. And yet it has not been accompanied by a move to rethink how, you know, who we should worship and why. And I totally think the time is right for that. Like I really do. I, I, think, it's, I think it's crazy. Um, that we are so enamored with these lives of le leisure and luxury, when again, empirically, when you look to see whether people are actually better off that way, the truth is that they, they're not better off than those of us who are doing jobs that we find meaningful, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the time is right. Well, we have, we have another question here about, you know, how one balances carbon reduction with scientific advance. You know, renewables require grid scale batteries, permanent magnets, nuclear requires mining, um, technological advance. So no manufacturing uh, acquires economies of scale and the position to streamline for reduced emissions without getting their feet wet. So how, how do the required advances reconcile with the initial driver? Yeah, I mean, there is no energy that is free from impact, right? It's all, it, all energy comes at a cost. Um, and, uh, and, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be climate impact for one, right? So you can, for, for mining, for example, which at the moment is fueled mostly by fossil fuels, it doesn't have to be, right? We can, we can make innovations there too. They all do require um, an investment upfront for sure. And, you know, so, so we, can't, we cannot expect to have a perfect solution. Um, but, uh, but I think that we should always look for solutions that do address multiple challenges simultaneously. And that's, that's one of the, you know, it's one of the key lessons coming out of the global assessment basically. And it's where, if you, if you really scrutinize, you'll see that our findings were actually quite different from some of the IPCC reports, which are focusing solely on the challenge of climate change. Um, and it's a harder problem when you involve some of these other societal challenges. Um, and so, yeah, my guidance is like, yes, always, always pay attention to the side effects on, you know, for water and for biodiversity, for habitat, for, um, 
stabilization of slopes, you know, all, all of those need to be considered so that we can choose solutions that are relatively good ones and so that we can mitigate any new problems that we that we give rise to. Yeah, I don't know I'm if I not captured sure. all of that question or whether there was an angle I missed. I know I, I have an example where early in my days when we were looking at um, um, different types of um, genetic changes to organisms. I sat with a, a scientist who was so focused. He talked about um, they were surprised when we had super canola that wind and bees were interacting and you know an ecologist could have told them that. So it's it's interesting, you know, having to think about that the whole. Uh, here's a new one for me. Um, Alexander has asked about biodanza. I don't know if I pronounced that right. It's a deep way of changing collectively, reconnecting with nature and each other. Have you heard of that? And, and do you have any comments? No. I haven't heard of that, That's, no. I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to learn about it. Yeah, I will. I'll have to, we'll have to write that one down. Thank you, Alexander, for, for the question. We have another one from Dale Jurdis. Um, he says, it seems clear to him that a politician or political party that endorses and campaigned on transformative change um, would at present have little hope of being reelected or elected. Um, so campaigns um, present the change needed as relatively painless. Is it possible or probable that any Western democratic government can lead the actual transformative change needed as quickly as it's needed? Yeah. It's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I I agree that uh, you know if, if if somebody campaigned on that idea that they would not get elected, totally see that, you know, and and so this is where we need to we need to do grassroots kind of organizing. If if you believe that that's something that is necessary, then it's going to take conversations with neighbors to help them to understand how you know that or why you believe that and you know and, and and what they could do about it if they come to see some part of that and you know i, I don't think it, it it for sure is not a solution that can be solved by governments and and as you as you write or as you say you know it's not it's not because governments are are you know, weak or self-serving, exactly. It's because they're not suicidal, right? <laughs> because the, the appetite is not there for some of the changes. Now, on the other hand, I would say that some of the changes absolutely would be supported, right? So it, it does really differ. The idea of electoral reform, like the liberal, the liberal government, like I said, it was elected partly on that campaign promise in 2015. And you know, I don't know that they that they would have enjoyed a, a, you know, complete loss of support if they'd done that. The reality is that they realized that they benefited from the current electoral system in the first past the post, right? They didn't realize how well it was going to work in their favor in 2015 until it did. And then they and then they weren't willing to make the change once they had the power to do so. But I think a lot of Canadians would have supported that if it had been done right. So there are elements of transformative change that are totally benign, that are not that controversial, but that are still hard in terms of making the systems, you know, remaking the systems. Um, so there are places to push um, and there are places to cajole. And we're, we're coming up to the end of our time. You've done well keeping up with all these questions that are coming at you. I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask one, one final question here. You know, we've seen in the chat, you know, different opinions about, you know, whether, you know, science is right. And um, if um, different values are, um, you know, moving in the right direction. And I would say, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of challenges with having, you know, black and white answers to questions around this whole subject area. And in the almost 40 years that I've been working in the environmental field, I've heard voices talking about how we need to change our way of life, uh, reduce our carbon footprint, move to a circular economy. I've heard voices against that. And yet, you know, we do know overall that the state of the environment is worsening and we continue to 
exploit the Earth's resources at an unprecedented rate. You know, and last week, you know, there was some progress in agreements coming out of COP26, but we also saw some um, late objections from countries um, that were high emitting countries. So we know some of what needs to be done. Um, and I, I wonder if you can just one final comment, uh, comments on, uh, you know, why reaching consensus is so difficult moving forward. And can you share your thoughts around, um, you know, what we can do to make some real progress, you know, leaving us with some hope as, as we um, close out the evening? It's not gonna be easy. I, like it's a it's a tough time to feel hopeful. I particularly coming out of COP twenty six, um, you know, there just wasn't there wasn't much that happened there to feel very hopeful about in in the context of the climate crisis in particular. But yeah, I'll do my best. So what I'd say is I think I think one of the reasons that we haven't seen more progress is because we've been putting too much faith in governments and in existing institutions to be able to solve this problem for us. And I think that what COP has revealed to many is that it's, that's just not a winning strategy. That you know, neither are individual governments in working well to reflect the urgency that so many citizens feel, nor is the kind of intergovernmental negotiation space which is entirely voluntary, working at all well to reflect the urgency of the crisis. And so what, what's needed now and what's absolutely possible as more of us realize that, right? And you, you can see it in the Fridays for Future movement. They, they, are, they can see, led by Greta's strident and completely, I think, appropriate voice, what we can see is that we need to move outside of those channels. We need to put real pressure. So for example, on the climate front, we've been talking about how we can do better as a nation. I think we're finally on a better policy track for our own emissions as we count them, right? Excluding the emissions associated with the fossil fuels that we produce and export, right? But we're only just beginning to get to the part of the conversation where we think about how we can leverage more elsewhere. Now, well, one thing is we could stop exporting so much fossil fuels, but even if we're not willing to go there, we, there actually is a lot that we can do. For example, we can leverage action through the border carbon adjustment, or in Europe, they call it the carbon border adjustment, or maybe I can't remember which, anyway. Um, that's a way that we effectively could put a tariff on goods that are coming from nations that don't have a carbon price, where our Canadian producers would otherwise be at a disadvantage because our Canadian producers are paying a carbon price. And so their costs of production are marginally higher than those in other nations that don't have such a carbon price. So it makes good economic sense in that with that logic to introduce a, an effective tariff, which is that's the carbon border adjustment, such that the Canadian government then takes the, the difference, right, in order to equalize the playing field. That puts a huge incentive, if it's done broadly, and the EU is planning on introducing this kind of an adjustment, it puts a huge economic incentive on other nations to take real meaningful action to address the climate crisis. We need to take those kinds of actions. We need to give up the myth that we can do this through our internal actions within nations and then the cajoling that happens at the COP meetings. It's not going to work, right? We need real actual economic tools. And it, we need to recognize that it's not going to be without trade-offs. It is going to hurt. If we do it, it will raise the price of consumer goods somewhat. It's going to have that effect. It will somewhat slow our economic growth. But, you know, as I said, right, we're at this point where we can't just weigh the costs and benefits because that kind of self interested thinking is going to lead to a crisis that I think many of us don't want on our hands. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Chan and Ms. Gallagher for your thoughtful presentation and this invigorating q and I, I think what stood out for me about tonight's presentation was the real need to revisit our relational 
values with nature. And the importance of that science policy interface and the interdisciplinary collaboration that we're gonna need. But moreover, each of us has an important role to play with this transformative change. You've been leading by example with your work, with your initiatives, and that is a real inspirational takeaway for tonight. On behalf of the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School and the Center for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy, I would like to thank our speaker and you, our audience, for joining us this evening. For any other information on upcoming JSGS lectures or to learn more about our programs, please visit us online at www.schoolofpublicpolicy.sk.ca. Thank you all very much and have a lovely evening. <laughs>